and welcome to the first meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone in the public gallery to please switch off their electronic devices or switch them to silence so they do not affect the committee's work? I welcome Ian Gray to the committee, or should I say welcome back, as he previously convened this committee. Ian is the uh, new Labour Party member replacing Monica Lennon. I'm sure members would like to join me in thanking Monica for her contribution to the work of the committee. And also, um, my special thanks go to Jackie Bailey uh, for her role as acting convener while I was on maternity time. I now move to item one, declaration of interest. Can I ask Ian Gray to please make a declaration of interest? I think to declare. Thank you. Item two, uh, decision on taking business in private. Do we agree to take items five, six and seven in private this morning? Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Item three, the 2016-17 audit of the Scottish Government's non-domestic rating account. We will now take evidence on the 2016-17 audit of the account and I welcome Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Stephen Boyle, Assistant Director and Michael Oliphant, Senior Audit Manager at Audit Scotland. And I now invite Caroline Gardner to make an opening statement. Thank you, Convener. Welcome back and Happy New Year to all members of the committee. Um, Convener, my report today is on the 2016-17 audit of the Scottish Government's non-domestic rating account under Section 22 of the Public Finance and Accountability Act. Stephen Boyle is the appointed auditor responsible for the audit, and his independent opinion on the account is unqualified. That means he's satisfied that the account properly presents the receipts and payments for the year ended 31st March 2017, and the balance is held at that date. The purpose of my report is to support Parliament's scrutiny and understanding of non-domestic rates at a time when Scotland's public finances are becoming increasingly complex with the arrival of new financial powers. In particular, I want to draw the Committee's attention to issues highlighted by the audit relating, first of all, to the financial position and, secondly, the transparency of the account. The first point to make is that the operation of the non-domestic rating account is complex. In simple terms, the accounts prepared annually to show the amount of non-domestic rates collected by councils and pooled by the Scottish Government, and the amounts distributed back to councils by the Government as part of the annual local government financial settlement. The balance on the account will always be in surplus or deficit at the end of the year due to forecasting and timing differences. At the end of 2016-17, the account showed a deficit balance of £297 million, meaning that in recent years the Government has paid out more to councils in non-domestic rates than councils have collected. This is the third consecutive year that the account has had a deficit balance. In February last year, the Government signalled its intention to bring the account back into balance over a number of years, but my report highlights that there's not yet a formal plan in place to do so. The second area to emphasise concerns the transparency of non-domestic rates, which form a significant component of the Government's annual budget and of its funding to local government. I've recommended that the Government should increase the consistency and transparency of financial information on non-domestic rates as part of its commitment to longer-term financial planning. This includes publishing details of how the amount distributed to councils each year is calculated and how it expects the non-domestic rating account balance to change over time. This will help Parliament to better understand how non-domestic rates contribute to the wider Scottish budget and its long-term sustainability, as well as the impact on local government. The establishment of the Scottish Fiscal Commission provides an opportunity to increase transparency in this area. Convener, we're happy to answer the Committee's questions. Thank you very much. I'll turn to Colin Beattie for the first question. Thank you, Convener. Um, Auditor General, um, given that... Uh, the, accounts, the, 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 the audit of this account is uh, unqualified. Could you just uh, explain why it's a Section 22? Absolutely. Um, as the committee knows, Section 22 reports is the um, route that I have for bringing matters to the attention of this committee and to Parliament that arise from the audit of the various accounts that um, I'm responsible for auditing each year. Um, they are sometimes used when um, there's a qualification on the accounts, but more often they're brought because there is an issue of public interest or of strategic importance that I think um, merit the committee's attention. Um, and in this case, as I, as I said in my opening remarks, 
both the fact that we've had a deficit balance um, now approaching 300 million over the last three years and the fact that the transparency of non-domestic rates um, can be improved in a context where the Scottish Government's budget is becoming more complex with the new financial powers, I decided it was appropriate to report on them for the first time in my term of office. Has the Government accepted your recommendations? Um, the government has uh, made a general commitment to increasing the overall transparency of its financial reporting and budget information, um, and it's also accepted the recommendations of the Budget Process Review, review Group that was published last June. Um, this fits very neatly within that. Um, there clearly are some choices about the way in which that's done, but the principle has been accepted. Given that uh, the main issue here really is this deficit and uh, how it's going to be dealt with, you said... Part, part of its timing. How much of that deficit relates to actual timing? I'll ask Stephen to um, give you some information on that in a moment, but it might be worth initially referring the committee to Exhibit 2 of my report, which is on page 8, um, which shows both the surplus and deficit in each of the last six years um, and the way in which that's combined to a cumulative surplus and deficit. Um, and that shows that over the last three years, um, we have had a deficit balance building up and we've had deficits in each of the last four years. So, th so this is not just a year-on-year -year movement. Stephen. Thank you, Auditor-General. Um, good morning. Um, much of it does relate to timing, and you can see that there are uh, fluctuations from one year to the next. Perhaps as, as well as Exhibit 2 to the report, Exhibit 1, in some respects, sets out really the, the movement between 16 and 17 that the report is, the account is complex. It is subject to the uh, post-year adjustments in effect of any <coughs> um, resultant allowances or disallowances from the previous year. I think nonetheless, though, that whilst there is a timing element that is, contributes to the, the scale of the, the, the £297 million pound deficit, it's not the only factor. And I think we see that there are <coughs> other elements, and the main one of that is the, the resultant policy choice that the government makes about the scale of the distributable amount in addition to the fact that, as Mr Beattie, you rightly say, that there are timing differences, and that equates to the fact that the account itself is never likely to be exactly in balance in any one year. Is there any way to factor out these timing differences so you get a real figure? I think we think that unlikely, given the, the scale of the account, that, um, and that £2.8 billion pounds or so is, is going through the account that any appeals process will likely straddle any one financial year is, is a reasonable position to say that timing differences will just be an inherent factor in the preparation and management of this account. Would you say that uh, given the timing factors and so on that the deficit as it is at the moment is <coughs> reasonable or could be anticipated as being about that level? I mean, I've, I've, I see it fluctuates quite a bit year by year, but nevertheless... I think, as we say in the report, we would expect that there would be fluctuations from one year to the next. We also note in the report that this was the 1617 was the fourth year in a row that had a deficit in the account and that had been growing. Um, and that, on that basis, we thought that was an important factor to capture in the report and in the annual audit report and, and the Auditor General's report uh, on the section 22. Simplistically, the councils do a projection, don't they, of what... Uh what the rates, what, what, what money they're going to receive from this, and based on that, the government decides what they're going to pay the councils. So presumably, uh, there must be some negotiation in terms of this deficit. And these negotiations, are they with individual councils or are they with COSLA? If I can just come in on that, I think um, the, the distributable amount that the Scottish Government will set is part of the Scottish budget, so it's part of the overall local government funding settlement. So where there are fluctuations that may occur during the year, then the Scottish Government will adjust the general revenue grant component of that. So the overall funding element of the local government's funding settlement is, is guaranteed for that year. So it will be part of the negotiations of the overall funding settlement for that year, as opposed to the individual element. So that would be a negotiation with COSLA? In terms of the... Just by the normal process of the... Uh, negotiations around the draft budget. Yeah. I mean, we don't we don't know how that is broken down in terms of who received what, do we? 
Um, can I just take us back a step from there? The overall distributable amount which the Scottish Government puts into the budget is a policy decision for the Scottish Government, then subject to the normal budget process. Um, that's not the subject for negotiation either with COSLA or with individual councils. The overall local government settlement, um, there clearly is an element of negotiation around. And then during the budget process, the um, not the forecast, the estimate of the non of the distributable amount may also be subject to change. So me members may recall that during last year's budget negotiation process, um, the Scottish Government revisited its assumptions about um, non-domestic rate receipts and um, increased the distributable amount by £60 million for the 2017-18 year, um, which had the effect of um, delaying the point at which the account was likely to come back into balance again. Now, that's, that's an appropriate approach to take, but it's not something which is transparent to Parliament or more widely because of the way the information is broken down between different budget documents and different financial reporting documents. And again, in terms of transparency, that's one of the reasons for this report. At 60 million, um, presumably that was based on projections as to how much non-domestic rates were actually going to be received. <coughs> One of the underlying reasons for this report is that it's not clear what the basis for the estimates of the non uh, of the distributable amount is. Stephen, I think, would like to add to that. I, just very briefly to say that um, the additional £60 million, as we, as we touch on in the report, was subject to further um, provisional collectible amounts that were provided by local authorities, so there's, there is an element of connection there. Just, just to be clear, the only way that this account can be put back into balance is by reducing the allocation to councils for non-domestic rates? Is that the only mechanism? Well, by reducing the amount of non-domestic rates collected, um, either because of increases in the tax base or increases in the tax poundage. Um, and because of the way in which the Scottish budget, budget is becoming more complex with more moving parts, my view is that there is room for more transparency about the government's assumptions for that in, in each individual budget year, but also over time as part of the government's commitment to longer-term financial planning. Okay. Thank you. Ian Gray. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I think you've partially answered this, but I wonder, Auditor General, if you'd say a little more about why you decided to wait till now to report on the deficit, because obviously, if we look at the table on page 8, the biggest deficit was in 2014-15 and there was a similarly very significant one in the, the following year. I just wonder why you waited till now. Um, as Stephen has said, we would expect there always to be either a surplus or a deficit on the account in any one year um, and you can see that across the um, second line up in Exhibit 2 and in more detail in the appendix to the report. Um, that's partly timing differences, partly forecasting differences. The fact that there is a deficit balance in itself isn't a matter of concern to me. The bigger concern is the extent to which the deficit is continuing to grow at the moment and the fact, as I say, that um, it's quite hard for that to be transparent to Parliament within the budget process at a time when there is when there are other elements of uncertainty and volatility because of the devolution of income tax and other new taxation powers. But the thing about the budget process is it happens annually. And if I understand your answer to Mr Beattie in the previous question, in essence, we're saying that as part of the budget process, the government can vary its estimate, in essence, borrowing against borrowing from local, local government's future budgets in order to balance this year's budget, so is that not something that should be reported on an annual basis so that we understand exactly how the budget has been arrived at? The recommendations... Is that, is that describing what you've just said, that they can change the estimate in order to... That, that is one of the possibilities. The challenge at the moment is that it's not clear what's driving changes in the government's assumptions about the amounts that will be raised and its decisions about the amount that will be distributed to local government in each budget process. Over time in the account, what's actually happened becomes clear, but there is a risk, as we see now, that that has led to the accumulation of a deficit balance that is increasingly significant. The recommendations that I'm making here about um, publishing the underlying assumptions and publishing a longer term um, look ahead of what will happen in each year and to the cumulative balance would be the answer to the question that you're asking rather than the individual decisions being made on an annual basis. 
Thank you, Kavina. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> can you help me out with something? Is this an act, the deficit? Is this an actual financial deficit? In the sense of, is there a minus figure in a bank account somewhere, uh, accruing interest, uh, that is presumably coming from a different budget to uh, service? The non-domestic rating account doesn't reflect a fund. It reflects an account which um, aims to show the amounts collected by government and the amounts paid out by government over time. Um, Stephen can talk you through in more detail the, the detail of that. Thank you. The non-domestic rating account, um, I suppose, Taking a step back, if I may slightly, the, the requirement to prepare the non-domestic rating account dates back to the Local Government Finance Act of uh, 1992, and its purpose is to demonstrate that the amounts, non-domestic rate amounts that have been collected have been paid out. Um, in terms of the account itself, it is a, it's referred to as an extract account of the Scottish Consolidated Fund, and the flow of funds ultimately through the Consolidated Fund are part of the overall arrangements. So as the Auditor General says, there is no, there is no uh, deficit sitting on a, a, a fund per se. The, the non-domestic rating account is really just to illustrate that non-domestic rates that have been collected have been distributed. And as we touched on in earlier answers, that won't always balance to zero. And you know, there, are, there have been fluctuations over many years, both in surplus and in deficit. <coughs> that makes sense up to a point. Um, so money is being, a cash sum is being paid out before receipts have come in, uh, hence why there's a, a minus figure. Uh, but where does that money come from then? So, so just to, uh, <clears throat> to maybe add to that, so the distributable amount that's set, um, as we've noticed in pre previous years, that is um, resulted in this uh, deficit arising has been effectively paying more to councils than what has been received. So that money as a distributable amount is uh, set as part of the overall Scottish budget. So that's where the, the, the money comes from, from the Scottish Consolidated Fund. And the money as it's coming back in, it doesn't quite match this distrib distributable amount in terms of uh, lower than expected collections then that's managed by the Scottish Government across its overall budget in terms of being able to, to, to balance it out. So to follow up on something that uh, Mr Beatty asked, the, the Government is, has an intention to get rid of the deficit balance uh, over time. So what is the practical impact of that on local authority funding uh, and their ability to deliver services? You're right, it has signalled its intention to bring the account back into balance. Um, ultimately, that will be a policy decision as to the overall funding that's allocated um, to, um, to local government in general. In respect of the non-domestic rating account, what that, what the, if that follows through and, and it does return to balance, what you will see over time is that the distributable amount will be lower than the collectible amount that's recorded for the purposes of this account. I think as we touch on in, in some of the key messages of the report, we see the, the relativity of non-domestic rate, rates compared to the overall um, funding arrangements for local government, which capture the revenue support grant and, and other elements of it. And we note just in the, that the non-domestic rate accounts, accounts for 29% of the total allocation um, to, to local government um, from, from the Scottish government. So if I may just be clear, because obviously we're using a lot of terms that people will find challenging, uh, I find challenging, uh, is it fair to say in order to get rid of the balanced deficit there may be a cut in the amount that is distributed to local authorities going forward? I think I would say that ultimately that depends and not necessarily connected to the reduction in the deficit on, in the, in the non-domestic rating account. It, it remains a policy decision for the Scottish Government as to how much it chooses to allocate uh, to local authorities. What it has signalled, though, its intention is to bring this account back into balance. And in doing so, if the distributable amount as it relates to this account will be lower, nonetheless, it may choose to offset that reduction through other funding mechanisms. 
you, you make an important point there, uh, Mr. Boyle. The, the Scottish government has chosen this. This is a, a choice to bring this account back into balance. So, there. Is, I'll, I'll say this as a statement, but take it as a question, if you would. There, there, there's presumably no legal or formal accounting requirement for them to to bring it into balance. This is a choice that's being made. Uh, and if I'm right on that, then presumably there's nothing to stop the Scottish Government running a deficit or a surplus in the future. That's, that's correct. There, there is no, the, the legislation that, um, that set up the account does not require it to operate in surplus or, or deficit. The only obligation on the account is that one is prepared, essentially, and it demonstrates that um, amounts that have been collected have been distributed. So on the, on the point you make about whether it's an issue in itself that is in deficit, there is nothing to, to prevent any government, the Scottish Government, operating the account in deficit. I'm grateful. Thank you. Bill Bowman. Thank you, convener. Morning. Um, just to follow up on what Liam Kerr said, I mean, to me, when cash goes out, there's more than cash coming in, then somebody has to fund it somewhere. So there is a funding requirement in that. I mean, we can talk about funds and parts of funds and just an account, but there, there is a deficit of cash going out. So in, in terms of the, of the, as we see it going in and out, the, the Scottish Consolidated Fund, in terms of the, the transactional things, which I think your question relates to, the local authorities and as they're, as they're paying money in during the year um, from as, as rates are collected and they receive money through the distributable amount from the Scottish Government and general uh, revenue funding, then these amounts are all netted off. So the actual transactions are just net payments between governments and, and councils. So the Scottish Government is out of pocket until this is resolved? The, the, there will be a deficit that will, that will be recovered from future. I just say they're out of pocket, or they're, you know, there is a deficit there of cash. That is required to be recovered from future years. Okay. The term signalling is a very good one. It means nothing really, does it? I think. Um, I mean, you know, you, you, there's no legal obligation on anybody to do anything if they have just signalled they're going to do something. Um, you say it's always in deficit or surplus, and you could understand that in small amounts, but when it, when it builds up, you know, is this a hole in the account? Does this affect how much the Cabinet Secretary for Finance has got to distribute this year? I mean, is he taking this into account when he's deciding how much he has available to give to local authorities or he needs to raise in tax? It affects the overall amount available to the Scottish Government budget in, in the year to come. Um, and depending on the policy decisions the government makes about the amount that it intends to distribute to local government as part of the settlement, it, account, it affects the amount available to local government. So at both levels, it's not possible clearly to keep on distributing more in non-domestic rates than is collected. And as you if, say, that's happened over If local authorities had paid this, um, Derek Mackay would have 300 million more to distribute this year. Or in his budget? It's not so much that if local government had paid it, it's that if, if the Scottish government had paid out less in the distributable amount in, in each of the last four years. Whichever way, if this was in surplus, his budget this year would be yes. 300 million more available. Yes. Now, I think also Liam Carr asked about um, accounting for this. Now, you give a clean audit opinion, so that means you have no doubt that this is recoverable, it's a, it's a receivable, it's, you have no doubt. Just They've only just signalled they're going to get it, but you're happy that they're going to collect this. One of the things that we're required to do as auditors every year is to consider um, the going concern principle and the, that there is a, um, a deficit on, on this account. So we, it's, it's for management to decide whether the account can continue or in, uh, any organisation can continue um, on, in any respect. Our obligations as auditors require us to take a judgment on that. So we consult um, auditing standards and also the, uh, the government's financial reporting manual, which sets out the, the criteria where that would be in doubt. Um, so and as we consider that and concluded our audit opinion, we were satisfied that there was nothing further and there was no need to, to make any reference to that in the, in the audit opinion. But nonetheless, we still think it's an important matter that ought to be brought to your attention. That's why we captured it in the annual audit report and through this Section 22 report. So you relied on their signalling? So we, we note, um, I, th I think ultimately the fact is that the difference between um, 
it being an account that is required to demonstrate the amounts that are collected and receivable, it being an extract account, and the presence of the, of the consolidated fund that allows us to take sufficient assurance that it's, that it's not one that requires to um, evolve into a, a concern over, over going concern for the purpose of this account. It's interesting that you require to bring it to us in a special report, but you wouldn't mention it in your, in your own report, but that's mm. your... That's your judgment. But, I mean, the other thing that I think we take from this is that the government can decide either to collect it or write it off at some point in the future. I'm not, I'm not sure I, could, I would say it could, uh, it could write it off. It could certainly decide to collect, but for as long as there is a deficit, there's a difference. They could adjust the amounts that they would distribute. Quite. Well, the deficit will, have to, will either have to will remain or it will be recovered, depending on the extent of the distributable amount or the amounts that local authorities uh, decide to collect. Um, there is no provision to, to write off any deficit balance on the account. Okay. Okay. Willie Coffey. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't see a particularly big issue here with this. This is just financial transactions that are affected mainly by timing. Changes one year, the local authorities will be the, the beneficiary, and the next year it will be the Scottish Government. And then up until the point where the account is completely balanced, there are no winners. Sorry, there'll be winners and losers during that process, but at the end of the process, when it's in balance, there are no winners and losers because the money sent to the Scottish Government is fully returned to local authorities. That's how I see it, convener. But what I wanted to ask is how the reconciliation process actually works. Do, do, does the Scottish Government uh, return back to local authorities the amounts that they perhaps overpaid per authority, or is it just a, a compounded amount that's distributed back to the council. So could there be authorities who ultimately lose out in this process, or do they get back what they overpaid perhaps during the process? I'll pick up your first point and then ask Stephen and Michael to um, follow up with the second. Um, I'd agree with you entirely that there wasn't an issue here if what we were seeing was a surplus in one year and a deficit with another. Um, but as Table 2 shows, what we've seen in recent years is um, deficits one year after another and a, a quite rapidly increasing um, deficit up until the end of 2016-17, which does leave £300 million that will need to be um, recovered at some point through this account within the context of the overall Scottish Government budget, which is why I decided to bring this report to the committee. Stephen Michael, who wants to pick up the reconciliation process? Yeah, I'll pick up that. I think um, what uh, is the, the, the question um, outlines is the, is the timing differences. So when at the start of the year, when the, the council estimates what they think will get in, they then will pay that amount during the course of the year to the Scottish Government. And obviously it's only until the, you get to the end of the year that you know how far that has been, has been out. Um, so there's two scenarios that will take place that, that, um, of where reconciliations are required, and that's if a council has received more than they expected, then they'll pay this additional amount into the NDR pool or the NDR account. Um, if a council has received less than they expected, then the Scottish Government, as you ask, will reimburse that. Um, I think the key point is that where there are fluctuations, the Scottish Government alter the level of the general revenue grant um, so that each individual council will get what they intended to get as part of the local government uh, financial settlement, so it smooths out any fluctuations to councils. That's kind of what I meant. At the end of this process, when it is in balance, there are no winners and losers. That's the way it should ultimately turn out, I would imagine. When it's in balance, that's the, ca that's yeah. the case. The process of getting it back to balance means that this £300 million is not available for spending, if you like, in the way that it would be had it remained closer to balance <coughs> over the last three years. Okay. Thank you. Auditor General, the Scottish Government have said that they intend to bring the account into balance by 2020. What's your view on how achievable that is? Um, it's difficult to answer that question in the absence of the other information that I've recommended should be available. Um, towards the end of my report, I set out um, a range of uh, things in paragraph 28, uh, which would improve the information and allow us, and more importantly, Parliament, to understand the underlying assumptions and the ways in which um, that would affect the budget as a whole and um, local government. Um, until we have that information, it's difficult to see what the impact is of bringing it back into balance, and that's why um, I think that signalling the intention is not sufficient. What we need is a plan and the underlying information that makes it uh, testable by Parliament as part of the budget process. So do you think the plan needs to incorporate that? I mean, 
the information you're looking for, will that affect, will that improve the unpredictability of, of the account as it stands? As we've said in answer to previous questions, there will always be some differences due straightforwardly to timing and some differences because a forecast is only ever a forecast and will never be right. But it should be um, possible for those forecasts to be uh, better understood, better tested and therefore over time clearer. And it would also allow Parliament to understand the policy decisions being made and proposed by the government about the amount that it intends to distribute to local government as part of the local government settlement. Um, as we touched on earlier, during last year's budget process, the government's estimate of the distributable amount was increased by £60 million. Um, that was based on um, information available to them but not available to Parliament about where the differences were arising. Um, we don't yet know what the outcome was, but in a budget that has more moving parts, more volatility, more uncertainty, I think it's important that there's more clarity about the way this particular strand of revenue um, is being managed over the long term in line with the government's wider commitment to uh, more transparency and longer term financial planning. Thank you, that's useful. Just for the committee's information, are there any other areas of policy where there's a similar lack of information or transparency that you could draw parallels with? Um, I think it would be difficult to talk about individual streams, but the committee will be aware that the overall thrust of the Budget Process Review Group report was to try and present, rather than individual streams of revenue and expenditure, the overall picture and the way those strands interact with each other. Um, I think it's difficult to overstate how much more complex the Scottish Government's budget is now than it was even a couple of years ago. That will increase further up to 2020 at least, um, and having that big picture is increasingly important. Thank you very much. Um, I am now going to uh, suspend for a couple of minutes to change witnesses. Thank you for your evidence. We will now take evidence on the administration of the Scottish rate of income tax 2016-17 under item 4 on the agenda. I welcome to the committee Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, and Mark Taylor, Assistant Director of Audit Scotland. I also welcome to the committee this morning Sir Amias Morse, Comptroller and Auditor General, and John Thorpe, Executive Leader of the National Audit Office. Can I please invite opening statements from Caroline Gardner, followed by Sir Amias. Thank you, Convener. I'll keep it brief. Um, convener, income tax, as we've been discussing, is a major part of the package of new financial powers being implemented as a result of the 2012 and 2016 Scotland Acts. Taken together, these powers are substantially changing Scotland's public finances. 
The reports before the committee today relate to the Scottish rate of income tax in 2016-17, following its introduction in April 2016. In considering these reports, it's important to bear in mind the respective responsibilities of those involved. First, for income tax, HMRC administers and collects Scottish income tax as part of the UK's overall income tax system and is responsible for developing and maintaining the systems needed to implement the decisions taken by the Scottish Parliament on rates and bans. The Scottish Government funds this by reimbursing the costs of administering and collecting Scottish income tax. The Scottish Government also seeks assurances that the system collects the correct amount of tax and that this is brought to account. Second, for auditing, the National Audit Office audits HMRC's accounts and the Comptroller and Auditor General is responsible for reporting to the Scottish Parliament on HMRC's administration of the Scottish income tax. I provide the Committee with additional assurance on the NAO's audit work in line with a recommendation from the Committee in 2014. This is the third year of this arrangement. In summary, my report confirms that I'm satisfied that the NAO's audit approach was sufficient and robust and covered the key audit risks. I'm also satisfied that the findings and conclusions in the CNAG's report are reasonably based. The Scottish Parliament now has the power to set the income tax rates and bans for non-savings, non-dividend income for Scottish taxpayers. This means that the Scottish rate of income tax arrangements were in place only for a single year. Nonetheless, the underlying administration arrangements that operated in 2016-17, particularly the accurate identification of Scottish taxpayers, remain fundamental to the effective operation of the new, wider Scottish income tax powers. I'll now hand over to the CNAG for introducing his report. Thank you very much, uh, convener, for inviting me, uh, and we're delighted to be here. Um, the Auditor General uh, for Scotland has uh, set out uh, HMRC's responsibilities uh, for their collection and administration, uh, and and uh, and spoken about our respective responsibilities. So I won't repeat those. It's probably worth just saying. Um, I mean, first of all, my role is really just the same as hers in relation to to um, the UK Parliament. Um, we're required under the Act to report on the adequacy of HMRC's rules and procedures uh, that, that, that they put in place in consequence of the Scottish uh, rate provisions for the purpose of ensuring that the proper assessment and collection of income tax charged at rates determined under those provisions is in place. Whether those rules and procedures are being complied with, we, we are obliged to comment on that. The correctness of the sum brought to account by HMRC which relate to income tax, which are attributable to Scottish rate resolution, and the accuracy and fairness of the amounts which are reimbursed to HMRC as administrative expenses incurred as a result of charging of the charging of the Scottish rate of income tax. This report is for the 2016-17 year, so there's probably quite a lot more to come next year, it's fair to say. And it's on the first year of HMRC's administration of the Scottish rate, which went live, as you know, on, uh, in April 2016. The key findings are set out in paragraphs 9 to 19 on, of the report and my conclusion on page uh, 10 of the report. Uh, in previous years, we've highlighted the importance of HMRC keeping its information on the Scottish taxpayer population up to date. And HMRC has now taken steps to improve the validation of who are Scottish and should be Scottish taxpayers. However, it's still the case that the identification of the tax base is fundamental to the effective operation of Scottish income tax and is an area which we'll continue to examine and push on in future years. So while things have improved, we're not saying we've reached a destination yet. Um, and I'm quite sure you'll want to ask questions or have a discussion about uh, change of address and, and, and so forth. On the correctness of the sums brought to account, the committee will appreciate that the final outturn for 1670 will only be report will not be reported until HMRC presents its annual report and accounts in July 2018. So I will be reporting to you in greater detail in my next report once I've had the opportunity to examine the sums brought to account. And just finally, I wanted to thank uh, um, the Auditor General and Audit Scotland. We've worked very well together, as we always do, but I'm very grateful for, for all the cooperation and, and close working as we've been doing our work. 
Thank you. Thank you both. That's very helpful. I'm going to turn to Alex Neil for the first question. Okay. I've got uh, two questions. Uh, obviously, um, this is the first year of operation, and we have recently had the Scottish Budget, where the Finance Secretary has put forward to Parliament proposals for an increase in the number of bans for income tax. And that would result in a number of people in the lower income groups having their tax bill reduced, but it will result in a number of people in higher income groups having their tax bill, income tax bill increased. So under the current arrangements, <coughs> what scope is there for people, particularly the higher income groups, to dodge the higher rates of tax, income tax in Scotland? Well, I'm not, I'm not being evasive in saying that I also think you can have a very useful discussion about that with HMRC, who are the ones who are on point for it. But clearly, the more difference there is between rates of tax uh, in Scotland and England, the more potential inducement there is to, 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 uh, to avoid. I will go back to what I said before. It's really crucial to identify Scottish taxpayers. We think that the systems environment, and I'm going to ask my colleague, John Thorpe, to say more about this, because he certainly knows more about it than I do. But we think the systems environment and the systems arrangements in HMRC should be perfectly adequate to compute different rates of tax accurately if they've got the right data about who the taxpayers are. And as you know, there's this continuing question about change of address and so forth. So. I, you know, I, th I think the view is it creates it creates pressure on the system. It should, there's nothing axiomatic to say that that pressure is can't be managed. Yes. So just to to develop on that, the the current system, um, the the MPS system was introduced in HMRC in 2010, uh, which consolidated uh, uh, tax records around individuals, which is a big step forward. Um, and each year, it's normal for HMRC to uh, make amendments to the code and the system in order to deal with basically uh, tax events, budget events, and that's that. That's quite quite, quite normal. And those those in, the implementation of those changes goes through quite significant testing, both prior to implementation and post implementation. That's a key focus for our audit. Uh, with the implementation of the Scottish rate that we will use, we'll also extend. We are extending our testing to include uh, uh, people with with uh, the the. the relevant Scottish flag as well, just to make sure that the, the requisite testing is done in that area as well. So subject to correct identification, as, as the CNAG said, we would expect the systems and the processes to be able to accommodate to accommodate that change. So, so you think the systems are already robust enough to identify anyone who's trying to dodge tax between Scotland and the rest of the UK? Um, we think that's something that need, the department need to keep looking at because those behavioural changes and, and as, as the tax system evolves. At the moment, I mean, I understand, yes. obviously, it's something you need to keep under review because yes. these guys have got all their accountants working on it yes. on a constant basis. But as things stand at the moment for this year, are the systems okay. sufficiently robust? Well, for, for this year, the systems were, were quite well aligned, uh, were, were aligned, actually, wholly, wholly aligned. Uh, changes come through in 17, 18, and greater changes will come through in 18, 19. That changes the environment, uh, that changes the risk profile. We would expect, as HMRC does, to reassess that risk as part of its normal business, and that will be something that we will be looking at to see how it has done that and, and what it has concluded. Right, so you will be keeping it under constant review as well? That's a normal part of our audit for any tax, uh, yeah. whether it's in Scotland or in, in the UK, uh, wider UK, yes. Okay, and, and presumably, um, if there is evidence of people deliberately trying to dodge tax and using the differential between Scotland and the rest of the UK, presumably, uh, if you gather that evidence, you will suggest and discuss with HMRC rectifying uh, measures. Yeah, but I think it's just worth getting... Uh, let, me, let me just make a sort of, I hope, clarifying comment about this. We need to be clear what we're talking about, dodging tax. OK, so if we're talking about tax evasion in people deliberately concealing the fact that they're Scottish residents or, you know, that that's one question. And it won't necessarily, the, the, the systems won't necessarily prevent that, that if somebody is actually telling lies or deliberately concealing what they're doing. But what we're simply saying to you is the majority of people don't do that 
uh, we think that the system is getting better at and is now achieving improved reliability, not perfect, but improved reliability on identifying people who are actually resident in Scotland. That's a different matter from are they, avoid, uh, are they evading tax acts to say doing things that are illegal, telling lies, or otherwise, or is there avoidance, which you were referring to as well, which is legally arranging, trying to legally arrange things to put themselves out with the scope of Scottish tax. And the systems have got nothing to say about that, frankly. So just for a second to be clear, there are quite a lot of threats that could occur in other ways that, have got, that will not be dealt with by the administration of the Scottish rate of income tax. So I'm kind of interested you say the system, in te terms of avoidance, the system has nothing to say about that. Well, no, but it doesn't, because if, if, it's, if there's some, you know, if somebody comes up with a, a tax wheeze, if you'll forgive me for saying so, that says, well, you know, I used to have a company, that's, or I, I used to be a resident in Scotland, but now I've got some way of establishing a legal argument that's credible that says that I'm actually a resident in England wouldn't astonish me if there was a big differential of tax rates. And they actually, and, and, and they're successful in that, in, in that argument, then, they'll, then they're resident in England. You know, so I like, so the Scottish rate, the, the systems will, will crunch that out. And I'm sorry, I'm just being clear that, you know, the question is, what is the, what is the, sta what is the legal, what is the agreed status? Uh, but, you know, I'm simply, when, when you find yourself with a significant differential, people will naturally give thought to, well, if I'm working in London, I'm, I've got a home in Scotland, is there a way I can present myself as a resident in London? That sort of stuff might occur if the differential is great enough. The systems won't automatically address that. Is I'm just making it clear that that's not their job. It's so, all, to can, give, can I just add to that very briefly, yeah. Mr Neil? It's also worth noting that what's devolved to Scotland from 2017-18 is non-savings, non-dividend income. Um, so if people are able to yeah. properly reallocate their income from earned income to one of those categories, uh, to savings dividends, yeah. then they, there's another movement there. And I think that yeah. falls very much no, into the category that. which my colleague yes. But, but let me give you a very practical example. Suppose my, supposing I'm earning 150, 160 grand a year. Uh, yeah, well, you've no chance in this job, I can tell you. Uh, and I am claiming that I am now living in England and therefore pay the lower rate uh, of income tax. I don't pay the 45p, I don't pay the 46, new 46p rate in Scotland. I'm paying the 45p rate that still is the case in England. But simultaneously, uh, my kids are getting free tuition or I'm getting free prescription charges in Scotland. Would your systems pick up that contradiction? Well, what they might, I mean, these are not my systems, all right? I'm the auditor. I'm yes. just going to stick to me. I'll stick to doing audits if that's well, all right. Are you satisfied? But the... let, me ask you, let me answer you sort of, to, to inform the committee as best I can. I think it would be very relevant for HMRC to look at any sudden transfers of status or any data, and they are good at looking at data normally. They're getting, they're getting pretty good at data in HMRC, in data comparison. So, and then, you know, so I would hope they'd approach any oddities like that. You know, the, if you can predict a likely threat to tax, to, to tax income, I would expect HMRC to take an intelligent approach to that, and I think it'd be a great thing to, to talk to them about how they go about that. Yeah, OK. And, and you think that their systems are robust enough to pick up, um, flag up where that might be happening? So, well, the, uh, if we talk about systems, there are maybe two aspects to this. We, we talk about the systems we've been talking about are basically tax processing, where the, the automated processing systems, which, which most of us, well, all of us come into contact with, uh, there is layered on top of that, which I think we've been getting into, is, is, is the compliance process and where HMRC have a choice about where they devote their resources to examine and, and, and track down these, these types of risks. And the, the latter point that uh, the CNAG commented on about the use of data, that is where HMRC can use its, its data to pinpoint those types of yeah. risk and right. has a choice about or has a decision to make about where it devotes its resources. But as things stand, you're satisfied as the, the National Audit Office that the current systems that HMRC has 
are at the moment sufficiently robust? Yes, for the in the in the automated processing, yes, as long as we get the taxpayer ad, ad, address correct, uh, 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 as materially correct, and they've learnt a lot. I think the department has learnt a lot in the last eighteen months as it's gone through data matching processes to clean and validate that database. Yeah. And it, I think its experience has been that, well, I, kn I know that perhaps some of the validation they've been seeking to validate against data sets which were inferior to it to its own, yeah. in fact, and that slowed down. Uh, you know, uh, required manual intervention, okay. but, but that knowledge they now have that knowledge, and I think. But I think how that system now works going forward will be very important. How we maintain this position and improve it. Okay. My final question is on a slightly different matter. In evidence yesterday to the Finance Committee in the Scottish Parliament, it became obvious that already there are issues emerging about the interaction between our powers over income tax and the UK's residual powers over income tax. Obviously, we are only responsible for rates and bans. The UK Treasury is responsible for policy on uh, allowances, reliefs, as the Auditor General said, on taxes or income tax on dividends and savings. Mm -hmm. And the two examples that came up yesterday were, as a result of the decisions and the proposals put forward by our Finance Secretary, uh, there's a big issue now around the marriage allowance mm. in Scotland and whether people in Scotland will now effectively be able to get the marriage allowance and at what point in the system and so on. And secondly, about the degree of progression in the system because of, the, again, the interaction between allowances and our new bans means that uh, about middle income, around I think it's 45 to 50 grand, you're paying more income tax percentage-wise than what you are if you're slightly above that. I may have the figure slightly out, but the principle is everything's progressive except for this narrow uh, group of people, but it's quite a significant group of people. Um, now, obviously, the sequence has to be the UK budget comes before the Scottish budget because clearly um, our budget can't be set until we know what's in the UK budget under current arrangements. But... It seems to me there is a process issue. I know, I, I know you're not responsible for policy, but there's a process issue that needs to be looked at in terms of the interaction now and the unintended consequences uh, that have clearly arisen already between the division of powers on income tax. Is that something both audit offices, the Scottish one and the national one, will look at? I think the answer to that is no, if you'll pardon me for saying so. I think that's a matter to be addressed with HMRC. I don't right. think it's a matter within my competence. I don't mean that I wouldn't try to help whatever to inform any conclusions that were being reached, but it's just not my job to lead that debate. I, I'm not unsympathetic to what you're talking about. It's yeah. just not my business, really. Is that your position as well, Auditor General? Um, I think it's something we can't look at because the, those sorts of interactions and the anomalies and perhaps unintended consequences that you've hinted at are a direct result of the settlement that came out of the Smith Commission, the Scotland Act 2016 and the fiscal framework. Now, they're very clearly policy matters which are outside my remit. Um, I think they are very important. As you say, they will affect both the um, timing of the budget and the way it's passed, but also its impact on real people as taxpayers, citizens and service users. Um, and I suspect that as we um, start to see the new powers being used, as we see the full devolution of uh, the VAT provision with the assignment of revenues, and we start to look at the interaction with the welfare system, there may be a need for the two parliaments to step back and look yeah. again at the way they work in practice. Okay, thank you. Convener, maybe this committee should flag up this issue to the Finance Committee as something they may want to address? Yep, that's certainly something we can look at, Alex. Are you finished with your yes, questions? Uh, thank you. <coughs> okay, Colin Beatty. Thank you, Vera. Um, I have to say, looking at this report, uh, there are quite a few questions here and quite a few concerns about the accuracy of the Scottish uh, tax base. I'm looking here, I'll, t I'll just take a few here that uh, jump out. Paragraph 1.9 highlights an issue that we've already spoken about where savings and dividends are uh, affected uh, by UK tax laws, whereas the Scottish thre tax thresholds are under the Scottish Government. Now, the, the Chartered Institute of Taxation and Association of Taxation Technicians tell us that this increases the risk of errors in self-assessment income tax. Now, 
obviously the changes that are taking place now, as a result, assuming the Scottish budget goes through as it is, are going to significantly increase these risks. Um, what steps can be taken to to mitigate that? Well, I do. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to sound a bit like a crack record here, and I'm terribly sorry. I don't. I like to be forthcoming with committees, and I'm. I'm being as much so as I can here. But honestly, while noting this is true, I think it's a matter for HMRC to talk to you about how they propose to mitigate it. I don't think it's something I can. I mean, you know, what what we're talking about is how effectively are they administering it? We think this is a, a. We think this is an issue going forward, but I think they. The question for them is how are they expecting to to, to, to mitigate these Then problems? from the audit angle, would you continue monitoring this? Yeah, no, as, absolutely. As an issue because we absolutely clearly... will. We absolutely will. We'll, we, we try and put in our report everything we think might be relevant to your consideration, even if it's not actually our job to, to, if to, to say, to pass on it. We'll try and put it there to, and we'll, we'll monitor it and keep you informed of it. Just moving on to paragraph 1.11. Uh, uh, in connection with tax codes. I was concerned here that it says HMRC and the Scottish Government have not agreed any minimum period between this, the finalisation of the Scottish Budget and the start of the tax year. Isn't this another risk? Uh, it is an issue. We, we, we believe it is an issue. and It, uh, it can give rise to uh, some confusion, and I think in, in, in this instance there were some taxpayers received two coding notices in a short period of time, which I think from a uh, uh, from the taxpayer's perspective, is not is not is not helpful, um, and I know that a HMRC are are looking at this. We will continue to look at this aspect of the administration just to see uh, the implementation of the of the measures and the incorporation of the measures into the tax system. Um, and I, I do know that HMRC are have have looked at this issue partly because I think this uh, the Scottish government asked them to you know to look at that. So it's something that we'll keep under review. Just uh, moving on to the small print in a footnote here, uh, resulting from paragraph 2.13. We're talking about an increase in income tax of 127 million and a deduction of 20 million in respect of a block grant adjustment. What is that? I think that might be probably more appropriate if, I don't know whether the, um, um, this is one for Audit Scotland to answer, I, I, I don't know. But, I mean, essentially what we were trying to do here, we are just trying to illustrate the, f the fiscal impact of the changes that will be implemented in, are being implemented in the current year. And, uh, sorry, big pardon, for, yeah, for 17-18. And we've, we've yet to audit that, that outturn. That's our responsibility. What this paragraph is seeking to do is just illustrate the, uh, the uh, estimation of the, of, the, of the budget impact of the, of the tax changes. It's simply Which that. is fine, but my concern is, what's this £20 million block grant adjustment? Is that as a result of the increase in tax? Is that some sort of clawback? I think Mark can help you with that one. Uh, I, I think we can write to you on the specifics of this, but just to give you a, a feel for what's going on here. So the the the, the net calculation of the £107 million adjustment included... Uh, an assessment, a forecast assessment of what the difference in, 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 in uh, the higher rate threshold would make to tax collection. And at the same time, there was a revisiting of that assessment, underlying assessment of what the forecast position was in relation to tax as a whole. And those two adjustments were put through at the same time. That's where the £107 million came from. We can write to you with some of the details of that. So did the and Scottish Government actually budget to get £127 million and they actually only got £107 so, no, the Scottish Government budgeted to get 107, and the way in which that operates uh, during that financial year is that's the amount that's confirmed within the budget. Okay. Looking at uh, paragraph 3.25. We're talking about risk models here, and of course, that, that is an essential part of HMRC. I mean, they, they live and die by the, by the risk assessments they take. Um, there's no real... They've adapted the standard risk model to cover Scottish-specific tax, tax risks. Given the changes that are taking place within the Scottish tax system, will they have to revisit this again? Well... 
I mean, may, may, maybe they will, but again, I'm, I apologize for saying this to you, but I think you should ask HMRC about that, because you want to nail them down as to what exactly they are going to do here. I mean, I mean, we're not saying this as a criticism, we're simply saying that they, they have a list of things that they specifically model, and then they have a, a list where they apply a general model, and at the moment they're applying a general model. Now, you want to move them over into specifically modeling risk for SRIT, which I think is good from your point of view, just have you need to have that conversation and you know and and move them over the edge. You, you need to make quite sure what you're going to get against what it might also cost you, though. If, if it, and that is a point. You know they're charging you for this, so you need to. I would get an estimate from them at the same time, if I may. Give you. A, I assume perhaps we can have HMRC in to pick up some of these points. I have already noted. Communication with HMRC, yes. Excellent. BT, yes. Ian Gray. Alex covered me. Okay. Liam Kerr. Uh, thank you, convener. So, uh, to pick up on something that Alex Neil <coughs> has said about the the residents, uh, it's something I've been interested in for a, a while. That a Scottish taxpayer is someone who has their main place of residence in Scotland. And that, that, that's quite a tight definition, or it, it's not an extensive definition. Uh, a place of residence is somewhere one resides for 183 days at least, it, it, I understand. And one resides there, uh, at least according to tax records, if one self-reports as residing there. Uh, so it seems rather straightforward to me, particularly for... Uh, the higher earner to undertake tax planning in a different way. Am I reading that correctly? Well, it's not just. A, so, shall I have a little go? This is. I mean, I mean, a million years ago, I was a tax partner, so you're getting extremely out of date comments here. I'm sorry, I, I'll, I'll, but I'll still have a go at this. The question of where somebody's main residence is 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 in, ter is in tax law is a matter of, is 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 taken. Is, helpfully described as a matter of fact. And what that means is there's a lot of... They can't just say, that's my main residence uh, for this purpose. It has to actually be that. So if it turned out that... And there are a number of indicators of that being the residence and they are the permanence of the established... So if you had somebody who was at a house and uh, all set up in Scotland and they were also working in London and staying in a flat somewhere and they suddenly decided to say that was a main residence then HMRC has grounds to examine whether that's genuine or not. And there's quite a lot of tax law on that, which mostly built up over the question of people establishing whether they were resident or not in the UK for tax purposes. So there is quite a lot... It's not, it's not just up to them. They can do whatever they like. It's not like that. There is a body of tax law to test that. Right. But it would be... It wouldn't be without the, the realms of possibility no. for me to, to, to base myself in Newcastle for 183 days as a question of fact uh, and yet carry out my work on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in, just over the border in Scotland, but be an English taxpayer. That would be possible, wouldn't it? Well, if, if, you only if you want to take an extreme example, if you had no other residence than one located in, in, in England... Uh, then the only way in which that could be uh, addressed would be as a question of whether it was deliberate avoidance of some kind. I mean, I'm, I mean, this is really questions for HMRC, not for me, but I'm trying to give you an indicator there. That, that, yes, people try and adopt a resident, residency for purposes of, and you can show that it's a, it's a sham, but if it's genuinely so much so that you're prepared to go and live in another country permanently... Mm -hmm then I guess you're going to be able to establish residency in that, in that country. Yeah, you can't really stop people doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's, I, say, I think that's probably all I can say on it. Uh, moving on to the costs uh, of administering uh, this system. The, uh, looking at the, the report, there was an administrative cost, which I understand gets back-charged to Scotland, uh, of £6.3 uh, last year. Uh, the report is fairly clear that that cost uh, is a function of differing 
tax rates. In the sense that the, further, the more different the tax rates between the jurisdictions, the more the administrative cost that will be back charged to the Scottish taxpayer. Uh, now, we are going to have a greater number of tax bans in Scotland uh, going forward. That's a fairly recent announcement. What is the impact on 6.3 million or indeed any other administrative charge uh, of having more tax bans? Is it possible to say five tax bans equals this administrative charge? Or how much is this going to cost us? Uh, okay. I, I think that's, um, and at this stage, we, since the, um, the budget changes or the proposed budget changes were, uh, the budget was announced, we, that sort of post-dated this report. So we haven't had a conversation with HMRC to really understand what that impact is or where, how far they've got in, in, in making that assessment. I think there are, um, uh, and again, I suppose that, that, that is a question to be put to them, certainly looking forward. Um, certainly we will audit it and we will ensure that the governance and the capturing of those costs is, is, is accurate and, and, and properly reported. Uh, but just coming back to, there are, I think there are two, two cost drivers here. So, so the, we talked earlier about the automated processing of, of returns. The system is geared up to, to handle that. <coughs> so in a sense, whether you process a return against an algorithm which is looking at five tax bands against three tax bands, I would imagine it's, it's not really that different because effectively the, you, the, it's the same operations. However, as we talked about divergence, whether that's from a Scottish decision or a UK decision, which, which gives, pr promotes the risk of um, non-compliance or uh, uh, behaviours which uh, might lead to uh, you know, people electing to uh, move to, from Scotland to England or likewise. Now that compliance activity, that is, there is a, an additional cost to that. If, if the HMRC decided to ramp that up because the risk profile had changed, then that, that, that would be a cost driver. And I think the CNAG alluded to that in, a, in an earlier response. So is it the case then that, uh, if I'm hearing you right, Mr. Thorpe, that uh, on the one hand there is a setup cost, uh, and once the system is up and running, that actually it should be fairly self-generating without too much admin cost. Yes. And on the other hand, there is a depending on the activity decisions taken by HMRC, that may have a cost to the Scottish budget. But since that's around enforcement. Uh, and decisions taken at the time. Yeah, that's I think, I think that's matter. exactly right. And that's what we've tried to capture in Figure 15, where we've tried to show the cost of... Well, we have shown the cost of implementation over time against running costs and shows that implementation costs are now dropping because the system's been put in place, taxpayer identification, the initial exercises have been, been conducted. Um, and now it, 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 we show that uh, based on what we knew at the time and HMRC's estimates, so, for example, in... 2018-19, they were predicting the running cost to go, uh, the overall cost to go down to just under two million, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with the balance of that now shifting into running costs rather than implementation. Now, if there are significant changes, that could, that that estimate, that projection could change. I understand. Thank you. If I can uh, just clarify for the public, Mr. Kerr, you, according to my flowchart, you are an MSP, and therefore. A Scottish taxpayer, definitely as MPs and MEPs, so you cannot uh, relocate to Newcastle. But I think anyone else has the, um, might intend to do so. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. I think I appreciate the response that Mr. Thorpe gave there to, to Liam Kerr in explaining the potential additional cost. It's, it's more about monitoring and tracking behavioural change rather than changes in the rates and the bands. I wanted you to clarify if that's what you meant, because the software procurement aspect of this has probably been the most costly. I think you mentioned in your paper it was about three quarters of the costs were IT related. So I wanted to ask you, how flexible is that system? Have you had a chance to look at it? Uh, if there are any more changes in bands and rates and so on, have they got a flexible system that can cope with anything like that in the future? Um, Again, I think this is, that would be a good conversation to have with HMRC as well. However, um, you know, my understanding is that there is capacity, I believe, uh, there is greater capacity to incorporate further bands within the NPS system 
as it as it as it was implemented in 2010. Can I just add something? So, if they wanted to, if if HMRC wanted to ask you for more money for implementing above what's planned, they need to show you that there was a, an actual differential cost that was, and uh, and you know that, that we can't think of anything like that, but it's not impossible they could come up with something that genuinely was another additional cost. It's just that we don't think it's particularly likely coming out of the systems that they've got, because we think they're quite robust and flexible. So it is, it's not impossible. They'll say, well, look, you've told them that, but actually we've got to do this over here, which we didn't have to do before. I just don't know what that would... We, just, we, we, we really don't see what that's likely to be, but it's not impossible. In terms of the NEO having an oversight of whether yeah. a system is capable of delivering what yeah. the originator says it's capable of delivering. We seem to have spent a huge amount of time at this committee over the past few years looking at IT procurement issues. I know that Scotland has been very much involved in looking at that. Do you have a similar kind of role in the rest of we the UK? Do. We, we do look, a look at, at the IT fitness procurement. for purpose of IT systems. We are, we are fortunate to spend a lot of time looking at IT. So, uh, I'm just asking again. But what we're telling you isn't, we're not, we're not to sort of take away from the assurance we're giving you. We, we think this system should be able to deal with uh, more than different different rate bands. That's yes. what we're saying. It, it should be, or is it? <laughs> oh, have you looked as far at as we uh, um, as far as we can see, it is. Yes, right. Uh, that's correct. Uh, at the point where HMRC didn't identify four hundred and twenty thousand Scottish taxpayers, were you involved in that process at that part? in that part of the process? Well, we, we were reviewing the process as, as auditors and, and we, we saw it as a key control point on, on the system implementation was actually to get that tax, Scottish tax base uh, right and, and properly identified. I think that uh, although I wasn't directly involved in, in, the, in the earlier reports, it took some time. It was an iterative process and there was some learning through that time and, and I think HMRC in trying to validate that, that uh, um, tax base uh, did a number of things, and I think HMRC learned through that process as well. You know, whose data is correct, who's who's got the more most accurate information. Was that an IT issue, the failure to identify four hundred thousand people? Was that an IT issue, or was it? Some well, other issue? insofar as they were using IT processes to to support that, so you're taking a database from the post office or whatever and running that against your own tax records, and then looking at differences. The issue that the learning for HMRC was that they were presented with differences and they didn't know whose records were right. So that required investigation. So there's, a, there's an element of, of manual examination. But were you involved in that scrutiny at that time? We, we, yes, we were. Yeah, we had uh, access to, to, to all of that process. Yeah. So, so who was it that identified the missing 400,000? Was it you guys or was it HMRC? Well, we became aware that there was, a, there was an issue. It wasn't, it wasn't the audit said you've, you've, you've got this wrong. We became aware. And I think indeed we were even talking to colleagues in Audit Scotland about this issue at the time as well. Okay. On, on the memorandum of understanding between the National Audit Office and Audit Scotland, is that now in place? Um, and I suppose are you both satisfied that arrangements are in place to, to manage this process going forward? And how, how does that extend to any potential dispute or conflict resolution? What's the process there? Um, as Amius has indicated, um, the Memorandum of Understanding has been in place for three years now. Yes. It works very well from both our points of view. Working relationships are good. My team and the CNAG's teams work closely together. It's helped by the fact that our audit approaches are similar. We use the same electronic working papers package. All of that helps. Um, I think in terms of our ability to give you assurance at this stage, um, what you need is in place. As I said to the committee before, as the remainder of the Scotland Act powers come into effect with the devolution of all non-savings, non-dividend income tax, VAT, new welfare powers, um, I think it will be worth um, reviewing that. And I know that the two governments are doing that at the moment, um, but we're very satisfied satisfied with the way they're working just now. Were you pub been published? I can't recall. Um, I think we we attached it to the papers to the committee yes, right. either right. last year or the year before that, but we can certainly let you have it again. Okay. It's on our website. It's okay. in the public domain. You asked a question about dispute resolution. Yes. And I mean, quite clearly, if we came before you and we weren't agreeing, we'd all look a bit ridiculous. And therefore, it's a very strong inducement on us. 
and it says Audit Scotland's got to give you a report on whether we've done the audit properly. And if there were, you know, if there was any risk of them saying they don't think we have, that would be very unsatisfactory. So the extreme strong inducement to reach agreement on everything. I, I, there was a, the reason we probably, and I don't recollect we've got a, a dispute resolution clause, but the dynamics of the situation we're doing are working as such that that would be inconceivable that we go forward in those circumstances. We just wouldn't allow that to continue. There actually is a clause in the MOU and it says we have to sort it out. So we, yeah. you have our assurance we would do that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your evidence today and thank you. Oh, sorry, Colin. Sorry. Uh, I think Bill hasn't. If you, I, Bill, I do you have a final question? question? On you go. Okay, Bill. Thank you. And just to say, um, for information, um, Sir Amias and I started our accounting training here in Edinburgh some 40 years ago in the same firm, but our careers have since then diverged and we both ended up somewhere different positions. I can't help uh, but notice uh, uh, that we both look extremely youthful. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I've got oh, I was going to ask a question. Oh, you yeah. <laughs> are! I thought you just wanted to make that point. That's not all he wanted to say. Okay. Um, Bill Bowman. <laughs> Sorry, I, I think, did we say there's something like 2.4 million Scottish taxpayers? Uh, do you actually have to pay tax to be a Scottish taxpayer? Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily, because what we're talking about is potential, not absolute. So if you had a year... Well, you had a lot of tax losses and you weren't paying tax. I mean, you don't need me to tell you this, I'm sure. But if you had a, lot of, if you had a year where you had, let's supposing I'm self-employed and have a year where I've got a lot of tax losses and no tax to pay, I wouldn't stop being a Scottish taxpayer. So if you were perhaps someone on a, 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 a retirement a state pension, which was covered by your allowances, <laughs> you would be a Scottish taxpayer, yeah. but... You would have no. That's do right. we know how many people are on that sort of level of not really paying I, cash tax? Shall we say? I, I don't know, but we can find out, um, and, and I, oh, we have that information. Mm -hmm. It's not. I don't have it readily to hand, but we can. We can. Answer I find that, that interesting. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Finished. Now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Colin Beatty. Just three quick ones, uh, convener. Um, in paragraph 17 of the uh, of the uh, summary, I'm quite concerned here that. HMRC doesn't know how many of the cross-border moves are being captured each year. Surely that's fairly vital. Now, the effort that they make checking this against other databases to compensate for that, there must be a considerable cost to that. Yes. I mean, this is we're, we're flagging this up to you because at the moment the law doesn't require people to report to HMRC when they change address. And it would make, and that probably doesn't matter that much to, you know, in the pre-devolution uh, environment. But it is something which would make quite a big difference in the context of the Scottish rate of income tax. So even though it's not, you know, it's not within the law at the moment, and so all that HMRC can do, and they, as far as we can see, they're doing a lot to try and say, well, from all the points of evidence we have, we're doing our best to identify Scottish. Taxpayers. We're communicating with them to remind people who might be Scottish taxpayers potentially, if we have any indicators, to try and encourage them to remind them of their duty to register and all of that. We're do they're doing all of that, but it doesn't change the fact that if you're not obliged to record where you live, it's a bit of a gap in the system, and therefore it is something which I think over time would be very helpful to Scottish uh, to, to, uh, Scottish, to Scotland to have in place. Uh, but that's way beyond my remit to say that. I'm just saying for, that's, we, we put it in there because we actually think it's relevant to understanding the situation. I mean, could I just, just add to that? that, that sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, the, uh, so there may be compensations in that. So sort of within the pay-as-you-earn system where employers ultimately capture this information as well, that there may be, at, over time, ability to catch up. But in other areas, perhaps, if people are in self-assessment, that may be the, the, the mitigations maybe take longer to kick in. That. Turning to paragraph 2.12, um, sampling data. This all seems fairly uncertain, and even this estimate of 2.5% above or below estimate of revenue, that's, that's quite a lot of money. Yeah, so the, right, the basic point we're trying to draw attention to here is that a number of forecasts and estimates have had to be made off the uh, 
personal tax model that HMRC uses. We are, uh, have suggested that as more information becomes available, and as we've gone through the identification exercise, we've got better information within the pay as you earn system through the flagging, uh, it's an invitation to, uh, uh, to look at are there better and more resilient data sources to support that forecasting exercise, because we, I mean, I think we're getting into the inter issues of, of, of uh, uh, fiscal issues in Scotland, which is a matter for, for other people, not for the NEO. But these forecasts are important uh, because they, they support quite significant decisions. So I think it's a case of uh, having got better information out of the pay-as-you-earn system, will that support a better forecasting approach? Other changes which possibly might be coming as a result of the, 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 the coming budget, is that going to make it more complex or change the way that they do sampling and the estimates that we're talking about here? I, we haven't spoken specifically about the coming budget changes with HMRC and, and, and how they will play into this. Um, as I say, the, 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 uh, going back to my first point, is that we just think as the data improves, it, there's an opportunity to look at actually is there, is, are there, can forecasting be improved by using drawing on this new new information. Do you think it's an area for the committee, if I can suggest, to keep on pushing forward on? You know, as it, you know, there are a lot of developments in information technology these days and big data and all that sort of stuff, which might actually help you get a much clearer view of a lot of these things. In, in the not too distant future. So I would keep talking to them and asking them about where we're going on all this. You know, this is a modeling, a model is only, you know, model, models aren't perfect as, as a method of predicting. We're not suggest it's not evil that they're not, it's just inherent in modeling that, that you know, a model is not a, is not a, is not a hundred percent accurate predictor. So this is quite, this is quite an accurate model at the moment. And lastly, uh, I'm looking at uh, paragraph three point for one in connection with pension providers, and I know this has been discussed before, I find it astonishing that it says in 3.44 that there's no definitive list of pension providers. Isn't, uh, surely pension funds and so on are regulated. Sure, you just go to the regulator and ask them for a list. Um, well, uh, I can't really answer that. I mean, I, I suppose that, that, that I mean that's a, that, and that's a, a, a good a good question. But we, um, it was a case of what we're drawing attention to here. There is a uh, for for the tax system to work effectively uh, for people. There's got to be good coordination between HMRC and the and, and the pension providers. Um, and a number of steps that we're trying to draw out in the report have been taken to try and improve that. Improve it certainly from a digital perspective. Uh, our finding was that when we asked. We were inquiring to say, well, who is that population? Who, who are that population? We we didn't get a clear a clear answer, and maybe this is something that we need to come back to. But there must be a huge number of pensioners receiving pensions from uh, yeah. English-based yeah. companies and so on. Sure. Yeah, uh, and we don't have that figure. It says here, yeah, but, yeah, pension well, providers we, don't know whether they're members of Scottish taxpayers. Yeah. Uh, well, when we. I mean, this is a continuing area for examination for us. We think this is this is quite important, and it would really, be something that we continue to I mean, pursue with the. Is it a interest. real problem, or is it just an apparent problem? Um, I think that's difficult for me to to answer. I think the uh, the the pr pension provider issue is probably a more of a peripheral one in terms of the fiscal impact, if if I'm honest. But it, it does impact on individuals, and 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 it's actually so so how relief at source works and is implemented, that, that could bear on the well, individual. I would just find quite a lot of unhappy individuals not getting pension tax relief at the point they're receiving their pension, but we don't think it's necessarily a matter which is, and to repeat what John was saying, it's not necessarily a matter that's going to hurt the Scottish Exchequer at all, but it is a matter where you might get a lot of noisy complaint from people who are not getting the, the right level of tax relief initially. I mean, presumably, a lot of the pensions are not going to push people into different, particularly specific different uh, tax bands and so on, because pensions by their very nature tend to be a bit lower for a lot of people. Uh, but if you're working for BT or whatever, you're going to get your pension paid, presumably out of London. Are we saying that they can't identify necessarily whether the people getting paid the pension 
should be Scottish taxpayers or not. That's what I'm reading from this. Am I misinterpreting? We don't know the answer to that. I mean, I mean, I'm not, I'm not being simplistic. But we are not so. This is a matter for HMRC to answer, and we, we're not clear that they can really answer that question yet. And just a wee point of clarification, if I may, convener. I think the issue relates to the pension contribution tax relief when people are making contributions into their pension funds rather than yes, receiving possible. pension payments back later. Um, so, that, as the CNAG has said, there, there is a risk that at the time they're making their contributions, they're not receiving the full relief. That will be sorted out later, um, but it's not affecting pension payments made to people once they retire. So we can identify the residency, the people that are being paid pensions, pension. that is not Absolutely. at issue. As part of the identification of Scottish taxpayers. Okay, thank you. I think we need to discuss um, communicating with HMRC on some of these issues that have come up today. Can I thank you very much indeed uh, for your evidence and for making the journey uh, to our committee this morning? We've already agreed to take the work programme discussion today in private. Can I also have members' agreement to take our work programme discussion next week in private? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That will mean that next week's meeting of the Public Audit Committee will be entirely private session. I now close the meeting to the public and move the committee into private session. Thank you.